In our last message for this conference, message six, we will be focusing on Psalm 72. And the subject for this message is the reigning Christ recovering the earth by watering. And as I was considering this afresh, I was impressed with what I would call the parallel involving Psalm 2 and Psalm 72. In Psalm 2, as we recall, the nations were rising up in opposition against God, against the Anointed One, the King on Mount Zion. This King, the Son of God, begotten in his resurrection to be the firstborn son, in addition to being the only begotten son in the Godhead. He is the anointed one. He is the king. He will come with a rod of iron and rule over all the nations, all the peoples. In Psalm 72, we have typified by Solomon, the king, a psalm revealing how Christ will be reigning on the earth when he returns with his overcomers. We may say that in Psalm 2, we have something prophetic, and in the typology of Psalm 72, we have the fulfillment. So I would like now to read through Psalm 72 and then relate this to something quite amazing in the book of Revelation, an item that, and I say this understandably, not many of us have considered much because it's a kind of a hidden matter and seems to be not so central, which is true. But we'll see how, it's, how important it is. Psalm 72. O oh God, give your judgments to the king and your righteousness to the son of the king. He will judge your people in righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bear peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. He will judge the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. They will fear you as long as the sun endures and as long as the moon endures throughout the generations. He will drop down like rain upon mown grass, like abundant showers dripping on the earth. In his days the righteous will flourish, and there will be an abundance of peace until the moon is no more. And he will have dominion from the sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. The desert dwellers will bow down before him, and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands will pay tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present gifts. And all the kings will bow down before him. All the nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy man when he cries, and the poor man who has no one to help him. He will have pity on the weak and the needy, and the souls of the needy he will save from oppression and violence. He will redeem their soul, and their blood will be precious in his sight. So he shall live, and to him shall be given the gold of Sheba, 
and prayer shall be made continually for him. He shall be blessed all the day long. There will be an abundance of grain on the earth, even at the tops of the mountains. Its fruit will wave like the forests of Lebanon, and those of the city will blossom like the foliage of the earth. His name will be forever, as long as the sun endures. His name will spread, and men will be blessed in him. All the nations will call him blessed. Blessed be Jehovah God, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous deeds. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And may his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. What a wonderful picture of the kingdom age and how there will be righteousness and justice and care for the poor and the suffering. Now in Revelation 4, the Apostle John was told in verse 1, come up here and he will see something. Immediately he was in spirit. Then he saw a throne, and one seated on the throne. That one is the true and living God. And verse 4 says this, And around the throne there were twenty-four thrones. And upon the thrones, 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and upon their heads, golden crowns. And out of the throne come forth lightnings and voices and thunders. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Now, what I want to point out with the very wonderful hope, uh, sorry, help of the footnote, around the throne there were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments. Now, the footnotes. One and two, I'd like to take the time to read them. But to say something basic in the beginning, these 24 thrones that have sitting on them 24 elders, those 24 elders are the leading angels who, according to the, the commandment of the throne, are ruling to carry out God's government in the universe and especially on earth. Remember from Jeremiah study, he's the Lord of hosts. This is his army. But the book of Revelation reveals, I can only mention it, when the Lord Jesus comes to rule the earth and he comes with co his overcomers, who will be co-kings, the elders will come down from the throne and remove their crowns. This means that a tremendous change in the carrying out of God's government will now take place. And the Lord will be ruling the king of kings and the overcomers 
will be the kings and the priests ruling instead of these angelic elders, these rulers. Right now, as we're having this meeting, I at one time and you in another, I in one place and you in many places, the 24 thrones are there, the elders are there, carrying out God's government. But it's worthwhile to read these footnotes. 24 is formed by multiplying 12 by 2. 12 indicates the completion of God's administration. David divided both the priests and the Levites into 24 groups to carry out God's administrative service. Therefore, before they are replaced by the church, the 24 angel elders are the ones who carry out God's administration. 12 multiplied by 2 signifies strengthening by doubling, indicating that the divine administration carried out by the 24 angelic elders is strong. The next footnote. The elders here are not the elders of the church, but the elders of the angels. Because here, before the Lord's second coming, they are sitting on thrones already. Among God's creation, the angels are the most ancient ones. Their elders are the elders of the whole creation of God. That they sit on thrones with golden crowns on their heads indicates that they must be the ones who rule the universe until the millennial kingdom, when the authority to rule the earth will be given to the overcoming saints, that they are clothed in white garments and have a harp and golden bowls full of incense indicates that now they are also priests before God. In the millennial kingdom, however, the reigning overcomers will be the priests of God. The elders' golden crowns indicate that they are also ruling ones. Therefore, they are priests serving God and kings reigning over his creation. But eventually, as verse 10 says, the 24 elders will fall before him who sits upon his throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power, for you have created all things, and because of your will they were and were created. In verse 10, we're told that the elders will come down from the throne. They will cast their crowns before the throne because a great dispensational change is taking place. To repeat and to summarize, then we'll go into Psalm 72. Now, the Lord is carrying out his governmental administration in Christ, who is the center, through these angelic elders and all the other angels. They are ruling, signified by thrones and crowns. But a great, indescribably amazing change will soon take place. When the Lord comes to the earth, inheriting the earth, establishes his throne in Jerusalem, and begins to rule over all the earth and all the people, he will not be alone. 
instead of the angelic elders ruling, the overcoming saints as the co-kings will be ruling. This will happen. The present age will end. The Lord will return with his overcomers. The 24 elders will come down from the thrones and cast their crowns before the thrones. And the overcomers will rule instead. If you're thinking or wondering what these 24 elders will do, we only know what's indicated in verse 11. They will worship, they will praise, they will glorify our wonderful God. So what is revealed in Psalm 72 concerns the reigning of Christ on the earth for 1,000 years. The government in the heavens, as far as the elders are concerned, has changed. On the earth, there has been radical change. No more human government anywhere. So no more four years, every four years, a presidential election. No more of all that goes with it. This is the kingdom. And in the title, we add recovering the earth by watering. And as we go through the outline, we will see two main aspects of the Lord's reigning, his ruling when he comes. First and primary is righteousness and justice and judgment according to righteousness to bring in justice. At last, there will be pure, unbiased justice all over the earth. Surely, those who have been mistreated, defrauded, denied, the time is coming, and it must come, when their cries for righteousness and justice are fulfilled. But today, some think the way is to set fires, to destroy things, to attack police, to loot, to do all kinds of lawless, rebellious things. They are advocating and advancing the kingdom of Satan. We are here seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. By the Lord's grace, I, and I'm not alone, have never been more thirsty than now for righteousness. Then the second aspect concerns the Lord's recovering the earth. He first must establish his kingdom over the earth. And then we will see he will recover the earth by watering, by gentle rain coming. We're not, I'm not speaking about literal physical rain but the spiritual significance of the water by watering. And the application of this is very endearing and I believe inspiring and precious. Now we can walk through the outline. At his second coming, Christ will take possession of the earth which has been given to him as his possession. And he will establish God's kingdom 
on the whole earth, thus recovering God's right over the earth. Seeing this, believing this, being constituted with this vision will enable us, equip us to live an overcoming life. The dear saints in the church in Portland and the church nearby, it's in Vancouver, Washington, but it's within an hour's drive, in the midst of the nightly chaos, to say the least, they may be assured the king is coming, the kingdom is coming, righteousness is coming. And as the church and as the seeking saints, they can in reality be experiencing his reigning now. A Psalm 24, 7 through 10 unveils the victorious Christ as the coming king in God's eternal kingdom. I recommend reading those verses. The gates of the countries, the nations are opened. And the king, the Lord of glory, Jehovah of hosts, is coming. The victorious Christ is coming as the king in God's eternal kingdom. Our Christ is victorious. When he comes, he will be the coming king. I just would like to say hallelujah now, inwardly. Praise the Lord. Praise the victorious Christ. Praise the coming king. Be the king of glory is Jehovah of hosts. The consummated triune God embodied in the victorious and coming Christ, Jehovah of hosts, Jehovah of armies. He has an army of angels in the heavens. In his move on the earth, in his recovery, he is forming an army on the earth. When he returns, he is the Jehovah of the armies of God. The victorious Christ. His second coming will be altogether different from his first. The first coming was mysterious. It was in secret. How he was born to fulfill the prophecy then also to fulfill prophecy to leave Bethlehem. It was the secret coming. But the second coming will be gloriously open and visible. One, Jehovah is Jesus in Matthew 121. And the footnote indicates that. And Jesus is the incarnated, crucified, and resurrected triune God who is strong in fighting and is victorious. We need to know this Christ, this Jesus even, Jesus. The man Jesus is the incarnated, crucified, and resurrected triune God. Our Lord Jesus is strong in fighting and he is victorious. And we need to enter spiritually into his fighting and victory now through our prayers. Two, he is the one who will come back in his resurrection with his overcomers to possess the earth as his 
kingdom. Oh, how wonderful it will be when the ungodly, lawless states of California and New York, New York are possessed by the coming king. <clears throat> How marvelous it will be when California and Oregon and Washington, cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, they will all be possessed by the king and his co-kings. How we long for this. We believe this. Well, other believers have been duped and deceived to just wait for their spectacular so-called dwelling place in heaven that the Lord is allegedly constructing for them now. They have been defrauded of the truth. We are here with Christ in us, the hope of glory, with a living hope, waiting for the king to come to establish his kingdom on the earth, to possess the whole earth as his kingdom. China, Iran, all of Korea will be possessed by King Jesus. Two, the reigning Christ is typified in Psalm 72 by the reigning Solomon, the son of David. If we reread chapters in 1 Kings, where Solomon is on the throne, and the queen of Sheba, she heard that Solomon was the wisest man on earth. And she believed it, yet she wanted to see it herself. And when she arrived, she was in awe, not only of Solomon's wisdom, but the, the, the beauty and the order of his kingdom in every way. The materials the way the serving ones conducted themselves. When we come to the crystallization study of First and Second Kings, probably we will devote some time to this. This glorious king, kingdom under Solomon, typifies the coming kingdom. In his prosperous and flourishing time, as indicated by the title of this psalm and by the first verse. So the title of the psalm and the whole psalm is concerning Christ. But what is important to us is the typology. All of this refers to Christ the King. <coughs> A. Psalm 72 reveals Christ reigning over the earth with all the kings bowing down to him and all the nations serving him. So we will have to see what kind of rulers there would be on the earth but just, let's just imagine, have a little picture in our mind that I think will correspond to the truth. Imagining if the prime minister of England, the president of the United States, the leader of Russia, all the leaders in Iran, the leaders of China, all, all bowed down before King Jesus. One day, there will be a universal bowing. Can you think of where it's mentioned? 
Philippians 2. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. B, Psalm 72, is a glorious picture of what it will be like for the Lord to recover, possess, and reign over the whole earth. Aren't you glad and thankful that our wise God gave us a picture? We are learners, and we have the clear word throughout the New Testament. But the pictures in the typology and uh, the various symbols in the Old Testament are really helpful. The pictures are not the thing itself, but they accurately portray. So King Solomon on his throne with lions there, sculptured on both sides, a golden throne and everything in order and peaceful. And there being an abundant supply. This is a picture of what will take place and Psalm 72 is part of this picture. So in our intuition of our spirit, we need to sense the beauty, the reality of this picture typified that is produced by the typology here. Christ will reign. And I believe that when <clears throat> he comes and we see him, nothing will be contrary to the picture. Of course, the prophecy will be completely fulfilled. But the reality surely will be beyond our praises and hallelujahs. The king is coming he will possess the earth. See, the reign of Christ, typified by Solomon, will be in the millennium, in the age of restoration. So we are praying, as the Lord instructed, for God's kingdom to come. We are praying for the age to turn and the kingdom to be manifested. But here in the present age, in the midst of chaos and lawlessness, we need to emphasize the reality and the practicality of the kingdom of God in our personal Christian life and in our corporate church life, we ourselves need to be experiencing in life all the aspects of the kingdom, be under the direct ruling of God, pray the prayers of administration and warfare in order for the Lord to deal now with certain things, matters, and persons on the earth, but being the reality and practicality of the kingdom now, we are paving the way for the age of the kingdom to be here and for the kingdom to come, to return with his army. Three, the reigning of Christ will be in righteousness and in justice by which peace will be ushered in. Please don't think I'm touching something political. I'm just touching something current. 
when those who are trying to protest properly according to the law and they declare no, no justice, no peace. That is true. There cannot be real peace where there's injustice. If people are treated unjustly, to say the least, how can there be peace? But I saw an interview briefly of one of these more uh, aggressive, almost violent protesters in that temporary little country in Seattle. A very intelligent woman, she said, the first thing we want to do is to remove everything, to destroy everything. It's unjust. And someone respectfully asked her, then what will you do then? What will there be? She said, I don't know. The point is valid. But the way of the world itself is unrighteous and unjust. To throw rocks, bricks, Molotov cocktails at police officers, thinking you're doing away with unrighteousness, that is more unrighteousness. So we agree with the universal hunger for justice, but we absolutely reject the world's way of attaining it. Christ will come, bring in righteousness and justice, and then there will be peace. A, when Christ returns, he will be the king ruling over the entire earth with righteousness and justice. Wonderful. Thankfully, we live in a system with certain principles based on righteousness and justice. And to a certain extent, a very significant extent, there is a certain degree of righteousness and justice. But it's not pure. It's not perfect. It's far from adequate. Is what we have now. We need to honor the government as long as we're not commanded to disobey God. But we're looking for the king to come in righteousness and justice. The subpoints. Righteousness is a matter of God's kingdom for it is related to God's government, administration, and rule. No wonder Paul says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness. If we are living in the reality and practicality of the kingdom, our personal life will be characterized by righteousness toward every matter, toward every person. We cannot be biased, prejudiced, preference, having preferences. All that is unrighteous. And in the church, corporately, as the kingdom in practicality, righteousness and justice must prevail Two, justice is righteousness with a judgment. So much depends on the judge. So here is the situation. And if there's to be justice, the judge must act in absolute righteousness. Without judgment, 
There's no possibility of justice. So if a certain criminal case or felony is brought before a judge, he or she must act absolutely according to righteousness as defined by the law. And the law itself must be righteous. Then a judgment is made according to that righteousness. And the conscience of all will be able to say, this is justice. Three, justice comes from judgment according to a person's righteousness. And it declares his righteousness. I'm speaking in principle now, but in a general way addressing an actual situation. Not every judge or even justice in a higher level, I'm referring to the person. There are those who are not righteous, not according to God and not necessarily according to the Constitution. So they can make decisions contrary to God's righteousness. And their, and their judgment is according to their own righteousness. Do you think, I'm illustrating again, that when the Supreme Court a few years ago passed the law, invented the law, that marriage involves two human beings, don't just say it's one man and one woman, one male and one female. No. It can be same gender. In the sight of God, that was absolutely unrighteous, contrary to the nature and word of God. But those justices thought honestly, I believe they're honest, to their own sense of righteousness, this is the way to do it. And those who wanted this outcome, they were clever, bypassed the legislature, laws, ignored the votes of the people. Let's get our way. And so any judgment that is made is according to a person's righteousness and declares his righteousness. And so we just see it. We can see it in the world to a large extent in a negative way. Oh, but in the kingdom, our person as reproductions of Christ will be righteousness itself. And therefore, every judgment made by the co-kings will bring in justice. For this corresponds with the fact that the foundation of God's throne in the new Jerusalem is pure gold, signifying God's nature in the attributes of righteousness and justice. B, peace is a sign that righteousness and justice are present. Again, because we're living in a time of chaos and lawlessness. Just reflect over the last four years. The kind of things that have been talked about, expressed, and done by certain persons in the government in Hollywood, especially in the mainstream media. Just yesterday, one person openly said regarding the passing away of the younger brother of President Trump, he said openly, 
the power of death took the wrong person. He wanted the president to die. This is just a sign of the chaos and lawlessness. How can we want anyone, even if we don't agree with their politics, their policies, we don't want them to stay in office? This shows the kind of person. They think this is justice. But when the kingdom comes, there will be peace. Now we're far from peace in this country. Where is it? Where is there peace? Peace in Chicago? Peace in Portland at night? Where is it? Only where there is righteousness. As a result of Christ's rule with righteousness and justice, the earth will be full of peace. Then the prophecies will be fulfilled. No more war. Destroy all the weapons of war. There's peace everywhere. No disputes between territories or nations or groups of people. I don't know what the population will look like. Imagine a thousand years of righteousness and peace. What a blessing, what a mercy it is for us to be shown the Lord's way. So we too, along with our fellow humans, long for justice and peace and righteousness and the end of war. But we will not take the world's way. Just, just read a little sketch on what happened in the 20th century. How many tens of millions of people were killed? What has happened under certain governments, under certain political systems? How we long and pray and cry out to the throne, Come, Lord, bring in the age of righteousness, we want to be on an earth full of peace. See, there will be no peace until Christ returns. Under his rule, peace will begin its reign. Some, even a good number, maybe especially the younger ones, but those who have a certain view of life on earth, they're still hoping for peace. But there will not be full peace. There will not be peace on earth. And if you think, as many did, in an election some years ago, oh, this one, Oh, this is like the Messiah. This one will bring in peace. And someone else is elected. No, this one will bring in peace. And someone else wants to be, doesn't even know what peace is. But we're clear. There will be no peace on the earth until Christ returns. So we will not be deceived by any politician claiming, oh, I know the way to peace. I know what has to happen. I need to have this kind of power. I need to do this or that. Then there will be peace. Be careful. It's false. We want the real peace. As we know from Isaiah 9, 6, he is the Prince of Peace. In the following verse, there will be no end. 
to his kingdom of peace. Just again, inwardly, I sense the longing. Come, Lord. Do what you need to do now in all of us, in all the churches, in the ministry among us, in the work among us, in your move in this country and throughout the earth. Whatever you need to do in the world situation, do it, Lord. We want you to come back. And we want to be with you when you come. We want to be one of those co-kings that replace the angelic elders. We want to be on the earth when you are reigning and there is peace and no more war. And there is righteousness and justice. And faithful and pure judgment everywhere. We're not here dreaming I'm not here dreaming about a mansion in heaven, a, a cosmic condominium being prepared for me. We're not dreamers in that sense. We are visionaries. We believe the vision in the Bible, the vision in Psalm 72. What a picture. Now we turn <coughs> to the second aspect of the Lord's reigning. Roman 4, and the time is just right for us. I'm just aware of time, so, and conscious of it, so there's a clock on the wall right in front of me, so I'm quite aware of it. Psalm 72 reveals that in his reigning, Christ will recover the earth by watering. By watering. I first, the first time I heard such a word as this was in the summer of 1969 when Brother Lee gave a series of messages on Christ and the church revealed and typified in the Psalms. And when he spoke about Psalm 72, he brought in this wonderful view to complement and to complete the aspect of righteousness and justice. And those verses, we read them, 6 and 8, just the rain coming on mown grass, it's not a thunderstorm. It's just a rain the earth longs for. There's a deep thirst in people. And the Lord will recover the earth not only by the rod of iron, but by waters from heaven. Point A, we quote verse 6. He will drop like rain upon mown grass, like abundant showers dripping on the earth. It's somewhat like the rain when some of us were children. You could, especially in summer, you could go outside and just be under the rain. You would just laughing with joy. Okay, you're getting wet. Mama, Daddy, it's okay. And they know it's okay. You're in the front lawn, getting all wet. It's a warm, pleasant rain. That's what it will be like. It's not a hailstorm. It is dripping. It will drop. Just coming down, drops. Christ gains the earth not by fighting and judging, but by watering. Okay, he has subdued all the enemies, taken possession of the earth. 
distributed the co-kings. But now there's a long period to recover the whole earth. including the environment itself. Those that are very concerned about the environment, God is also concerned. But the worldly concern is ungodly. You have a kind of environmentalist religion. Do you think you can change the situation? The Lord created the earth. He redeemed the earth. The earth is his possession. Now he wants to recover it by watering. Surely he will do this. How? I don't know. It's not revealed. And those who represent him, express him, and are co-kings, we will not only have the rods of iron as mentioned in Revelation 2, but we will be channels of water. Two, in his coming back, the Lord will not mainly exercise his righteous judgment. Rather, he will come primarily like showers to water the earth. Christ will have mercy on the earth and he will come back gracious, graciously like flowers of rain to water the barren land and to satisfy the depressed and empty people. It might be in the life study of John. Oh, okay, this will come out. I'll mention it when I come to point A. But the Lord cares for the earth. We were created, humans, out from and with stuff from the earth, the dust of the ground. In this sense, we are properly earthy. But we'll have a, a resurrected body. But this is where we belong. Our home is not in heaven, in an imaginary dwelling place. It's on the earth with the kingdom. A, the whole earth is a dry and barren wilderness. The whole earth. And many evil things spring forth from this drought and dryness. People are often sinful because they are disappointed and dissatisfied. There's the reference, John 4. The Lord was led to go to a certain place. And there was a woman in the middle of day, an odd time to draw water, but there she was drawing water from the well. And the Lord asked her for a drink. Then the conversation took place. I won't repeat it. And he spoke about living water. You'll never thirst. And she said, I want this water. And then he said, go call your husband. I don't have one. That's right. You don't have one. You've had five. Now you're living with a man. He's not your husband. Why one divorce after another? Why now giving up on marriage and just living with a man? It's deep thirst. Disappointment. Dissatisfaction. I remember Hudson Taylor ministering about from this verse, this portion in John 4. He defined thirst thirst as any unsatisfied longing, un, any unfulfilled longing. 
So the whole human race is thirsty. We're not excusing any kind of sinful behavior, lawless behavior. But there needs to be some realization among us as we contact gospel friends and our burden for people to be saved. They sin much of the time because they're so saddened, disappointed, dissatisfied, so thirsty. Oh, I, I dream that marriage will be heavenly. Now, after these years, <clears throat> it's not. Oh, I thought getting this new luxury car now doesn't function so well. It's so costly to repair. There's thirst throughout the whole human race. And the, our Lord knows this. So he will come as water, refreshing, restoring, recovering, satisfying, thirst-quenching living water. Little b, the Lord Jesus will be the king, not merely by exercising power to subdue others, but mainly by supplying living water to satisfy the thirsty ones. There we have it in Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. He who hears says, Come. Is anyone thirsty? Come. Whoever wills, come. Drink of the living water. Even as the bride is ready to be raptured, she echoes the Lord's call to the thirsty people. See, in that day, all nations will be reigned upon by the Lord Jesus and will be happy under his dominion. Happy. They won't be gritting their teeth and saying, no, we're under strict righteousness. This has been destroyed. Las Vegas isn't the Las Vegas we know. All the casinos have been burned. No gambling is allowed. Admittedly, the desert is blossoming. It's a beautiful place. And I've got to live now under this strict righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness. We emphasize that. The kingdom of God is peace. We stress that. The kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit. This will be a time of happiness of joyfulness, of gladness over the whole earth. The Lord knows. He knows the need of all of us. He knows and understands and must be righteous in dealing with us. He knows that we said this, we did this, we bought this because we're thirsty. We thought this will give me some enjoyment, some satisfaction. And it may for a few minutes. Then the, there's no peace, no satisfaction. So he comes even now with the living water. So the whole earth will be happy under his dominion. And if we are advancing and becoming the reality of the kingdom of the heavens, 
our happiness should increase. If we're under his dominion, there's righteousness, peace, joy, happiness. The rest of C, all will be satisfied by his living water. And so I don't know what kind of material things the people will have then. I have no idea. But some might be thinking, oh, I won't have my smartphone. I won't have my iPad. I won't have my laptop. I won't have this or that. Well, I just don't know what it will be there. But based upon this word, I know, no matter what's not there, you won't care. You will be happy beyond description. B, a quote from verse 8, he will have dominion from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. So now it's the matter of the Lord ruling, of having dominion. And I might be a little slightly just going ahead, but this picture, Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a river of water of life proceeding out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And this river was flowing on the street, which is pure gold, signifying the nature of God. And in the river, on either side of the river, indicating the tree of life is in the river. This is how God will reign in the new heaven and the new earth. And to a certain extent, this is how the Lord will reign in the millennium. A river will be flowing. Even there are prophecies. For example, in Joel chapter 3, rivers flowing out of Jerusalem. This is the way he will have dominion on the earth. This is the way he can have dominion and will have dominion over you and me. He flows. Yes, he deals with sinful things. He must be righteous. There must be justice, for sure. But it doesn't stop there. The righteousness is for the flowing. Romans 8.10, our spirit is life because of righteousness. One, the Lord's kingdom will spread to the ends of the earth by his flowing as a river. So we'll have to wait and see. We hope we will be there. How will everyone and everything be subdued all over the earth? There are people thousands of miles away from Jerusalem. Well, the co-kings will be there. And where they are, the river will be. Righteousness will be there. And the water of life will also be there. Small a, Christ will have dominion from sea to sea. And will flow as a river to the ends of the earth. Where the flow is, there his dominion will be. Some dear saints in uh, the land of Kiwis, New Zealand, they say, and I find this quite delightful, they're the outermost part of the earth. Maybe so, geographically. I don't know how God views it. But this flow will be everywhere. And because and where the flow is, there the dominion will be. 
sisters and brothers, this is the main aspect of how the Lord will rule and how the co-kings will rule. And we need to learn this now. Whatever our function is or standing is in the church, if someone is an elder, you need to rule by flowing, by supplying living water. If we're serving with the young people, they have to be in order. There needs to be righteousness. But water should be flowing. Flowing on every level. We want to be in the reality and practicality of the kingdom now. Little b. The Lord's dominion will be by himself as the flowing river. He will gain the dominion and recover the earth by his watering. So at least initially, almost all the listeners to this message are in the southeast. Once the messages are posted, we don't know who will be viewing them. But way back in 1996, Brother Lee called me at home. He was burdened for the four corners of the country. He gave me a direct assignment. He said, there needs to be a Labor Day conference in the southeast. And this was maybe in early, early August. So he said, please go there and carry it out. Contact the brothers. And I called Brother Dave and the brothers in Atlanta. And I said, brothers, I just got a word from Brother Lee. So that, is, that was the beginning of the Southeast Blending Conference. Now, I don't have any territory in the recovery. I don't have a kingdom. I don't want one. The Southeast is not mine. I'm the only one that can have a conference there. It was ridiculous. I would never think that. But you're in my heart all the time. All the churches, all the saints. I've never been to Fort Myers. But Fort Myers, the church that is, is in my heart. I know some of the brothers bearing responsibility. I love you, brothers. And I'm just happy that you just see, even starting now, there'll be much more flowing throughout all of Florida. Oh, how the Lord must spread in Florida. But don't think any of the states are in rivalry. Oh, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in North and South Carolina, in Virginia, in Tennessee. Lord, let the river flow inwardly and outwardly. Two, the Lord Jesus will recover the earth by means of the river that will flow from Jerusalem. In that day, the center of the earth will be Jerusalem. And the center of Jerusalem will be the house of God from which the river will flow. Ezekiel 47. That house will be built the Lord's throne will be established. The Son of Man, who is Jehovah of hosts, will be on the throne. And the river will flow from Jerusalem to every part of the earth. And the last point, this river will reach all the earth in four directions, as in Genesis 2, 10 to 14. So we began our conference on considering from Psalm 2 the rebellion of the nations, the lawlessness, opposing God himself 
opposing Christ the King. But then we saw his wonderful person, Christ the King, the Son of God, the heir of the whole earth, is on the throne. And now we conclude with Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. And those two Psalms, plus all the others we considered, 16, 46 through 48, and 110, are all part of the procedure experientially. So I believe that what, what the Lord put in my spirit and is in my heart has been flowing out that all of us, from now until we are raptured, we will be supplied to live an overcoming life in increasing chaos, lawlessness, ungodliness, rebellion, by knowing and experiencing Christ as revealed in Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalms 46, 47, and 48, Psalm 110, and Psalm 72. May we know him more and more. May we have the longing that Paul had. I want to know him and the power of resurrection, his resurrection. So we want to know this Christ, experience this Christ, and personally and corporately live out, express, and testify this Christ as we are preparing for the coming of the victorious King Jesus, Jehovah of hosts. The time is coming. All the gates on earth will be thrust open and the Lord will return and the age will change. We all want to be there. If we want to be there then, we need to learn how to experience this Christ in his kingdom now, little by little, day by day, personally and corporately. My brothers and sisters, fellow citizens in the kingdom of God, the Lord bless you in every way. May he increase in us every day. Praise his name.